Hello everyone and welcome to The Wrap, brought to you by Michigan Medicine Headlines. I'm Dan Elman with the Department of Communication. And I'm Bailey Merzik, Dan's illustrious co-host. Today we're going to take you up the chain of command and discuss how a new policy will help keep faculty, staff, patients, and families safe at Michigan Medicine. Now before we get into that, you are commanded to go back and get caught up on any episode of The Wrap you may have missed. You can find the shows on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast hosting platform. New episodes can also be found on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and as part of the headlines, we can review. And with that, let's talk to Nicole Templeton and Dr. Katie Bates. First, can the two of you introduce yourselves and explain your roles in the organization? Sure, thanks. I'll go first. I'm Nicole Templeton. I'm um, an administrative director in the Office of Patient Safety and a nurse by training. And my name is Katie Bates. I am the um, Associate Chief Clinical Officer for Quality and Safety in our Children's and Women's Hospitals. I'm trained as a pediatric cardiologist and then did some additional formal training in quality and safety as well. So the High Reliability Tool of the Month for April is standing up and speaking up for safety and using ARC or ARCC. But let's break that down for our listeners. Can the two of you talk about what all of that actually means? I'll start. And Katie, I'd love to hear from you too. So standing up and speaking up for safety is essential. When you have a concern or uh, something doesn't quite seem right, or if you have an improvement idea, um, or if an error does occur, it is essential that people feel safe saying something. So we're trying to create an environment in which people feel comfortable and safe speaking up. Um, and ARC is a tool that helps us do that when maybe the words are hard to say. So ARC stands for ask a question, request a change, say, I have a safety concern. And if the concern persists, then you activate your chain of command and you continue speaking up for um, that concern or that safety uh, issue happening in the moment. Yeah, and I guess I would just add on, we know people speak up for safety all the time. Um, and so for us, the reason why we emphasize this and we talk about these tools is because we recognize that speaking up for safety can be really hard, whether that's in a clinical situation where you're everybody's kind of on going in one direction and you're thinking, wait a minute, I don't think this is right for this patient. Or even sometimes in teams where it's not a clinician, you're, nobody's um, safety is in danger, but you're really thinking that the team is going down the wrong track. It can be really hard to stick your neck out and be the person to say, I think something isn't right here. And so these tools are really to help people think about how to do that and have a structure to how they speak up. ARC is really all about starting with the lightest touch possible and kind of um, escalating how firmly you're speaking up. Um, but to me, just as important as speaking up for safety is really talking about what happens when someone around you speaks up for safety and making sure that we're all listening for safety at all times, regardless of our role in the organization. Okay, so when people think about speaking up for safety, they usually think of only um, clinical environments, but whether you work in patient care, research, um, or even office settings, how can all employees do their part in speaking up for safety? Uh, thanks for asking, Bailey. So we see safety concerns across the system, regardless of the setting. Um, suppose somebody working in an office is about to lift a box that's on the ground and is extremely heavy. Um, if you observe that situation, you would you would say something because you want that person to be safe. You don't want back injuries. Um, and so that is a situation where you may speak up for safety. Um, if you're in a meeting, um, as Katie was talking about, and somebody comes up with some ideas and you think it might be going the wrong direction, it is essential that you have the words to speak up so that we can provide the most reliable, safe, high quality service across the institution, uh, regardless of where we work. Yeah, I think that's great. Can we talk a little bit about the fourth step of ARC, which is chain of command? And I know there's an upcoming chain of command deadline at Michigan Medicine. What does that mean? And can you just discuss what chain of command is in general? Um, sure. So I'll start. Uh, yes, there's a new chain of command policy that has been um, written and edited and approved across the system over several months time, and it is now in production. And that policy states that uh, we need to have visible, accessible 
chains of command across all areas of our institution. So that for what you just said at the end of ARC, if your concern is still not addressed, um, you know that you can keep going because safety is our most important priority um, and we're going to keep going. And so um, that chain of command policy states that they need to be accessible and visible. And the institution has set a deadline of May 1st, 2023 uh, for leaders to have crafted those chain of command documents for their areas. Now, a chain of command document will look different um, across the institution based on the different situations, the different organization of your department um, than it may be in. So I'll let Katie talk about how CNW has approached building their chain of command documents because they've really had a lot of rigorous review in that space. Yeah, well, thanks, Nicole. And I, um, to me, chain of command is really about um, making sure that people know that they have somebody who's got their back at all times. And in a semi-perfect world, the moment you speak up for safety to somebody around you, that person hears you, they respond in exactly the way you want, and the, the issue gets resolved immediately. Unfortunately, we don't live in a semi-perfect world. And so the reason why we have this chain of command is so people know where to go if the first person they talk to, their immediate leader, um, doesn't respond in the way they want. And this is something we think about a lot, uh, particularly in our pediatric hospital, because we recognize stuff happens in the middle of the night. At 2 a.m., a kid gets sick. And a lot of times, especially on, say, one of our surgical services, the person who's there to take care of that patient is a rotating resident who may not have spent a lot of time taking care of kids. They're learning how to be a surgeon. This is their rotation in pediatrics. They're really good at the surgery stuff, but they may not know how to take care of a six-month-old. And we actually had a really memorable um, uh, case a couple years ago where we had delayed recognition of sepsis. Um, and it was one of the things that really emphasized to us how important the chain of command was because we want all of our trainees, all of our bedside nurses to know who their resources are. And we actually in CNW, again, in the pediatric side, we intentionally have multiple attending physicians who are in the building 24 hours a day solely for the purpose of backing people up and making sure the kids that we take care of are safe. So we take chain of command really seriously. And we started, I think, over a year ago, sharing um, the first kind of templates for chain of command and saying, let's call this out. If a kid is, is sick, you start with the first contact going up the provider chain of command. There's a nursing one as well. If you don't hear from that person, you call the attending physician on call, then you can move up to the medical director. And then there's always, um, again, these attendings are in the house, are in the house, our critical care physicians are there. And we just want, again, that hypothetical PGY3 um, surgeon resident to know who's there, who can come be a second set of eyes, who can be an expert in taking care of pediatric um, patients. So our units have all um, been working on uh, adapting the template and making sure it works for them. For example, in our PACU, there's two separate chain of commands. One is if a patient is having a post-op issue that's more surgical, they go up the surgical chain of command. Another is if it's more of a complication from anesthesia, they go up the anesthesia chain of command. At the end of the day, we just don't want any of our staff to feel at 2 a.m. that they're alone and they don't know where to turn to, or they've spoken up to the person right above them and the answer just doesn't feel right, but well, what am I going to do? We don't want anybody to feel that way, and we don't want our patients and families to be experiencing that. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And we have a chain of command in the quality department where we don't see patients directly. We're not working at 2 a.m., but it's still essential that we need to know who to go to. I've seen a chain of command in a clinic that was the supervisor's pager number and the manager's pager number and the director's pager number on the whiteboard. That is a visible, accessible chain of command. So people where, know where to go, um, just as Katie said, like who's your backup? Um, it's also essential we have swift escalation capabilities. I need help right now. Um, and so there are a lot of swift escalation mechanisms within our institution, including an administrator on call, the OCA, uh, position on call. Um, and so those are important to clarify. And just as a reminder, none of the chain of commands are intended to replace um, those sort of emergent uh, clinical pathways such as the code team or rapid response team. It's a great point, Nicole. And the other thing on the topic of swift escalation is really thinking about what means of communication we're using, right? So Again, if it's 2 a.m. and you're worried about a patient, it is not a time to be using secure chat and Epic. You need to be paging or using a direct cell phone number because you need help quickly and you don't want to be relying on an email or secure chat and Epic and hoping that somebody happens to be signed in and looking for those messages to come. Yeah, so how do, how do all patients and 
even employees, how can everyone benefit from having a clear, um, defined, um, accurate chain of command? I think it's really just cutting down um, the kind of um, spinning or running around in circles or worrying like, oh my gosh, who's here to help me? What, what do I do with this? And just knowing, okay, I, I may not have it memorized. Maybe I have it on a badge card, but I know the spot in the unit where it's spelled out and I can go find the page or number of the medical director or I can find the supervisor of my supervisor, whatever the case may be, just knowing that you don't have to worry about how to ask for help and actually letting you spend the time on going and getting that help and clearly communicating your concern to the person who's going to help you. Yeah, so a chain of command should facilitate that communication, not impede it. And that's why it's so important. Yeah, uh, this is all great information. I just want to ask your, your the two of you, because you're experts in this field, circling back to the speaking up for safety part of this. If there are people who may not necessarily feel comfortable speaking up to their superiors or somebody who's above them, right, on the chain of command, do you have any sort of tools or tips that can really help them get more comfortable in that setting? Because I know how important it is that employees at all levels speak up if they see something because it's possible that they see something that the person above them doesn't. Yeah, so there's many reasons why somebody may feel unsafe to speak up. And I would say, let's go back to our high reliability universal relationship and reliability skills. Those relationship skills, um, team familiarity, feeling valued and respected as part of a team are foundational for somebody's comfort um, in speaking up. And there are very, you know, perceived or real fears of being retaliated against or blamed or, you know, it's the culture, it's the community that we create um, in, in that sort of, you know, adds to that willingness or comfort or, you know, courage, whatever it may take to speak up. And it's, it's not just that person speaking up is going to save, you know, solve everything. The people to whom they're speaking up need to receive the message, understand it respond appropriately. And we talk a lot of times about maybe using STAR in that moment, right, from our universal skills to stop and think for a moment. Because sometimes when somebody speaks up, you get sort of this knee-jerk reaction of defensiveness or no, we're fine. Um, we need to listen. We need to pause and listen and, and hear um, what, what may be happening and what that concern is. Um, and take time as a team to respect that person's uh, you know, concern and listen and address it accordingly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is just to acknowledge that speaking up for safety is always hard. It does not matter where you are on the organizational chain. I had a, a really memorable moment a few years ago where I was um, doing a consult and I was in a room where a nurse was drawing labs off a patient central line. And I was watching her and I thought, I think she should probably be wearing gloves. I'm not sure, but I think that doesn't look like the right thing is happening, but I wasn't sure. This is in spite of me being on and leading our CLABSI committee for pediatrics, but I wasn't comfortable in the moment because I wasn't 100% sure if I was correct um, and it didn't, didn't feel safe for me to say anything. But it was a really powerful example for me later when I thought about it and then talked to some friends about how I could have spoken up even though I was uncomfortable. It was a really important moment for me that we need to recognize that speaking up is really hard. It's hard whether you're a doctor, a nurse, a tech, working in the quality department, working in the communications department, it's just hard because we're human beings and we need to acknowledge that. But I think what helps the person who needs to speak up is really thinking about why it is that it's important for you to speak up, right? So we're trying to keep our patients and families as safe as possible. We're trying to do the best job that we can. We're trying to make Michigan Medicine the very best health system that we can. So we all have an obligation to do that. And that's what's driving us to speak up. Usually when you're speaking up for safety, there's no other reason. It's because you really believe that's the right best thing to do. When it comes to listening for safety, I think it's so important for everybody to listen, not just leaders, but really, if you've worked here for two days and somebody just started yesterday, you might be the leader that that person speaks up to. Um, and it's really important to acknowledge and recognize how hard it might be for that person to speak up and to listen to them. They might be completely wrong, but that provides you an opportunity to help them understand what's going on. So asking questions, I think, is always good. Speaking up for safety, that's why ARC starts with ask, is because a lot of times you can just say, like, I might be missing something, but don't we usually do this? Or are we worried about that? Um, it's a really non-threatening way to start. And I absolutely recommend that people start with that A part of the arc. And again, all of us need to be aware when somebody is asking a question, that's a moment for us to stop 
and think about what's going on and wonder whether we're missing something or if there's an opportunity to make things safer or better. I love it. Thank you so much for that insight, for the stories that, that both of you shared um, and for breaking down the chain of command and ARC for us. Now, Katie, your work isn't quite done here. It's time for the lightning round when we ask our guests four quick fire questions. It's your rap debut, so are you ready for the lightning round? Ready as I'll ever be, fire away. All right. Okay, so of course it's spring break season. Have you gone anywhere recently or do you have any trips planned? Yes, we had a big adventure in February. I flew for the first time in three years with my two young children, uh, neither of whom had ever been on a plane before, and we went to Florida. It was an amazing adventure. It took a lot of uh, planning, a lot of HRO skills to get all of us there, but we made it. We had a really good time, and uh, we did not have to go too far up the chain of command to make that work. <laughs> <laughs> See, they work in your work life and in your daily life. Just keep those in mind. <laughs> All right. Well, this week we've got seven degrees and possibly even 80 degrees in the forecast. If you could choose the perfect weather, what would it be for you? Yeah, I think 75 and sunny is, is about it. I would prefer to be a little closer to the beach than we are here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and a little farther away from my Zoom screen to fully enjoy it. But that's a pretty good setup for me, 75 and sunny. I mean, I think the crazy thing is you could have your Zoom screen on the beach at this point. <laughs> Uh, it's just not quite the same, I find, <laughs> actually on the beach. <laughs> Earlier this week was National Pet Day. Do you have any pets at home? I do not have any pets. Again, two small children are pretty much keeping us busy. <laughs> would both dearly love to have a dog, although one that doesn't bark would be the preference of my two-year-old. No pets at home right now. All right. Now, last week, the new Super Mario movie came out and set all sorts of records. So speaking of movies, what movie could you watch over and over again and never get tired of? And I'm guessing it's probably a kid's movie. No, it is. Uh, I always have a really hard time with this, but I have kind of a, a, a series of movies that I always want to watch around Christmas. And so I kind of think of those. I, if I watched them every month, I might get tired of them. But uh, kind of the classics like White Christmas, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, Love Actually. I find that those just get better and better every year so. I'm definitely the sucker for love, actually. I will watch that every year. Yeah, so good. Well, thank you, Katie, for playing along with us and sharing information about Chain of Command and why it's so important. If you want to learn more about Chain of Command in the HRO Tool of the Month, go to mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. Now, also at Headlines in Recent Days, you'll find a recap of a recent diversity, equity, and inclusion survey, and you'll learn all about the new Michigan Health Lab, a one-stop shop telling tales of the discoveries, treatments, and patient stories compiled by the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication. Find all that and more at mmheadlines.org. Okay, Dan, so we asked Katie about designing her perfect weather forecast. So what about you? What do you think the perfect day would look like for you? So I'm completely on board with Katie. Like 75 and sunny to me is perfect. I want there to be sort of a cool breeze um, because once you get above 80 degrees and especially if there's no breeze at all, it just gets exhausting to be out in the sun. So I, if it were, you know, this, this week, basically all year round, I would be perfectly content. What about you? Yeah, I agree with that, but maybe a little cooler, um, for running conditions because I'm outdoor runner, but this is still great and it's way warmer than we've had lately. <laughs> um, so it'll be nice to get outside and and run in the sun. And, and I feel like we had such an easy winter and then February was like just laughing in our face. That was like, just kidding. It's not going to end now for two more months. And it was, yeah, we were punished for having an easy <laughs> December and January. All right. It's time for the weekly trivia contest. First, congratulations to loyal listener, Brian Wu, who won the contest on our last episode. Now for this week's question, here's Bailey. This week's question is how many team members participated in the recent DE&I 2.0 survey? Once again, how many team members participated in the recent DEI 2.0 survey? You can find the answer in this week's headline story, and once you know it, send it to headlines at med.umich.edu for the chance to win a prize. That's all the time we have for this week. Thank you so much, Katie and Nicole, for joining us, and thanks, as always, to all of our listeners and viewers for everything you do for patients, families, and each other. We'll see you next week. <laughs>